So here's a really cool thing you can do with your nano VNA if you've got one of these things. Or if you've got a regular vector network analyzer, you could do it with that. What we have is the vector network analyzer, the nano VNA, hooked up to the input of an oscilloscope. And it's reading the input impedance of the scope. And guess what? It's not what everyone thinks the input impedance of an oscilloscope is. Of course, we rarely have the opportunity to put our device under test right at the connector of an instrument. We end up having cables, or in the case of an oscilloscope, a probe. And as it turns out, we'll see in this video, the input impedance looking into this probe is not what most people think either. Most people think it's 10 meg in parallel with something like 10 or 20 picofarads. But it's not, at least not at high frequencies. At low frequencies, yeah, that might be a decent approximation. But at high frequencies, uh, this thing will load your circuit more than you think. We'll also mess around briefly with this little RF demo board that has Smith charts on it so that we can review what we expect to see on the network analyzer for the different cases. So before we jump in, let's take a quick look at the topics we're going to cover. We'll look at that RF demo kit and talk about Smith charts to review. Uh, and then we'll look at the input impedance of my spectrum analyzer, which turns out to be a 75 ohm rather than a 50 ohm. Then we'll look at the oscilloscope with the 10 to 1 probe on it. Find out what it really is. It's not 10 meg in parallel with 10 picofarads. Then we'll look at the scope with no probe and we'll explain why the scope is doing what it is. Finally, we'll talk briefly about why this matters, and that's going to give us a quick look at an RF tuned amplifier circuit, and that's going to be a subject of the next video. So to look at some of the test structures on the RF demo board, we're going to need to switch cables. Uh, this is one that came with the RF demo board. Fortunately, the length of this cable is essentially the same as the length of this one, minus a little bit here. We're only going to 100 megahertz in our measurements, so the little bit of difference is not going to matter. As we'll see, uh, the calibration that I did to this point uh, is going to work perfectly well with the RF demo board cable. And when I say work perfectly well, I mean it. This is the open structure on the RF demo board, and the point is right here at all frequencies from 50 kilohertz up to 100 megahertz, so it's an excellent calibration. Moving on to a more interesting test structure, this is a simple capacitor from the center to ground on this connector. Now notice that it's sweeping around the outside of the chart as it should. Here it goes in a little bit. That's because the capacitor is not perfect. It has a little bit of loss resistance in it, but it's essentially on the outer boundary of the chart as a capacitor should be. Now interestingly, test structure 7 on the demo board has a curve that looks a lot like what we saw on the oscilloscope. And what is that? Well, it's a capacitance in series with a resistance. Lastly, here's a look at a 75 ohm resistor from 50 kilohertz to 100 megahertz. So remember, everything on this line is resistance. Short circuit on the left, 0 ohms, 50 ohms in the middle, and infinity ohms on the right. Here, we're pretty close to 50 ohms, or at 75 ohms, and we're just a little bit to the right and 33 ohms is a little bit to the left of center. So what does our spectrum analyzer, which has a 75 ohm input impedance, look like? Well, it's where you would expect, just to the right of center, at all frequencies pretty much, except at very low frequencies, it's over here toward an open. Why is it 75 ohms? Well, this is an 8591E with option 001, which is 75 ohms for the cable TV industry. Why does it become an open circuit at low frequencies? Well, the input is protected against DC using a series capacitor inside the unit. Now, we're usually not going to have the device under test right up at the input connector of the spectrum analyzer, so I've put a cable on here and let's see what the impedance looks like now. Now, it varies with frequency. Instead of being a 75 ohm dot here, it's this circle 
So it goes from 75 ohms to 37 ohms and then back to 75 ohms. Goes capacitive when it's down here and inductive when it's up here. If the transmission line is 50 ohms and it's terminated in 75 ohms, then it's not going to give an exact 75 ohms. It's going to vary. However, if I terminate that 50 ohm coax in a 50 ohm load as I've done here, it's pretty close to 50 ohms at all frequencies. Slightly off because probably this coax is not a perfect 50 ohm coax. And before we leave this part of the demo, let's recognize that that's an important thing. If you want something to not be affected by the interconnection cable that you're using, then you need to terminate it in the impedance of the cable itself. Now that's one of the main reasons why RF test equipment and RF circuits in general at very high frequencies tend to try to maintain 50 or in this case 75 ohm input impedances. So that coax interconnections between one part of the circuit and the next part of the circuit or in this case a device under test and the instrument itself won't affect the measurement. It'll still look like 50 or in this case 75 ohms. But there are cases where 50 or 75 ohms is way too low an input impedance. For example, an oscilloscope is designed to not load a circuit at all. In this case, the input impedance to the scope is 1 meg in parallel with 30 picofarads. Well, we've seen that it's not, but in, essentially it's a very high input impedance at low frequencies. If you hook a 10 to 1 probe on it, like we've done here, then the input impedance can be bumped up to something like 10 mega ohms in parallel with some picofarads. Except that's only at low frequencies. Let's see what it is at high frequencies. So I have the network analyzer set to be reading from 50 kilohertz to 100 megahertz and the marker is set on 30 megahertz and it's currently reading 20 ohms in series with 26 picofarads. At 60 megahertz, where the marker is now, it's 66 ohms in series with 94 picofarads. Neither of those measurements is anywhere near what most people think it is. Most people will quote the input impedance of this probe as 10 meg in parallel with, say, 20 picofarads. But as we've seen, it's not. Now, a couple of important comments here. I do have this probe set to 10 to 1. Also, I am using the pigtail here to connect to ground, which RF engineers know you probably should not do. We'll take a look at a way to avoid that in a second. In addition to that, I've stuck the tip of the probe into my SMA connector. Never do that unless you own the SMA connector and you're very careful. That's a good way to mess up the input terminal of the SMA connector. So here's the right way to do it for RF measurements, at least to avoid the inductance of that pigtail and the effects on the impedance measurement of that. What I've done is I've taken a small wire and coiled it up and wrapped it around the ground shell here and then attached that or touched that to the outer case of the SMA connector. Center pin is still stuck in there very gingerly. And here's what our measurements give us now. Again, it says 68 ohms, but it's reading 31 picofarads, probably a reasonably accurate measurement. Again, nothing like most people think it is, at least not at these frequencies. At audio, you're fine to believe that it's 10 meg in parallel with whatever picofarads, 10, 20, 30, whatever your probe is. But in the case of RF frequencies, do not be fooled. Now, what if we skip the probe altogether? What if we just use one of these coax cables like this that's terminated in some alligator clips as seen here? Well, here's the input impedance. It's 4 ohms and 135 picofarads. Wow, that's a lot of picofarads. Where'd that come from? Well, it's the capacitance of this cable at low frequencies. Now the marker here is at 3 megahertz. And for RF work at 3 megahertz, like HF uh, ham radios, that could be a thing. So that's one of the reasons you need the 10 to 1 probe to lighten up the loading as much as possible.
Here I shifted the marker down to 50 kilohertz, illustrating that at audio frequencies you don't have to worry too much. You can get away with a simple cable like that most likely. Now getting back to our interesting discovery that the input impedance looking into the scope itself is not one mega ohm in parallel with 30 picofarads, as just about everybody believes, including the full wisdom of the web, we would be right to ask what the heck is going on. Well, the scope I have that I was demonstrating on is a Tektronix 2215. I've done this on many scopes, including Agilence and Keysights and many, many others, and they all have about the same thing going on. Now, the 2215 is the one we were looking at, so I pulled up the service manual with the block diagram for this, and let's look at the input circuitry. There it is. Channel 1. It has a series resistor, R101. The signal comes in through that, through the input coupling, either AC or DC, depending on what you set it to, so we'll ignore that. There's some attenuators for when you're on the higher voltage scale settings. And then it goes into a input buffer amplifier and onto other amplifiers and attenuators. Now, any amplifier is going to have a capacitive input impedance, and so that's where the capacitance fundamentally comes from. But why is this resistor here? Well, at very high frequencies, we need to terminate the coax cable in the characteristic impedance of the coax. Well, where's the coax? Well, it's a probe. There's a probe, and the probe has a piece of coax. And so that's why we need R101. And here it is in the schematic level diagram. You can see R101 again, and here it's labeled with its value 75 ohms. Why 75? Well, I'd be willing to guess that Tektronix scope probes use 75 ohm coax cable. Does it matter? Well, at audio frequencies it doesn't matter. And for some RF work it may not matter either. And quite frankly, if you're using stuff at RF, you're probably using a spectrum analyzer, possibly with an active probe that gets around all these issues. But if you do try to use an oscilloscope, maybe because you're working at HF or something like that, or even 100 megahertz, where an oscilloscope could be used, then that could be a problem. And the place that it ended up being a problem for us when I was doing this the first time and noticed it is in an amplifier such as this. The input to the amplifier is over here, comes in, the output is here, there's a tuned circuit at the top, and I put the probe there, and it lowered the effective value of R4, which affects the gain of the amplifier as well as the bandwidth. And it was completely messed up. It made no sense whatsoever compared to what it was supposed to be. And eventually, we figured out that this was the problem. So, it just depends on what you're trying to do. So, join me again in a few weeks, maybe. I don't know when, but... I'm going to try to put together that circuit that I just showed you, and maybe we'll try probing it and watch this loading in practice. Until then, thanks for watching, and try out some of this neat stuff with your Nano VNA if you've got one. Just be careful, don't hook it up to a signal generator that could blow it up or something like that.